now we're getting into the second part of this book, which is emotional impact. Um, this deals with mood lines, and I'm going to define those for you. They're lines that bring about a certain feeling or emotion. And this particular quote I really like. Without emotional content, we make pictures. With it, we create art. If you can bring that emotion into your photograph, you're creating art. With it, you have a recording. And of course, a lot of us take recording type photographs, but that's not necessarily a piece of art. So many of the techniques I've already gone over with you will help you bring about emotion, but these particularly are designed to do that. Now, mood in the Oxford Dictionary is the atmosphere or pervading tone of something, especially a work of art. It's the feeling you get. It's the, it's the atmosphere. It's also, it induces or it's suggestive of a particular feeling or state of mind. Now, if you notice in life, there's a lot of emotions that we can feel. Every photograph doesn't have to have somebody smiling on it and happy. You know, if you're, if you're out capturing life, like how many people are familiar with Annie Leibovitz's work? Very few times that she's, do you see anybody smiling in her photographs. She captures them kind of moody. A lot of them have interesting moods, you know. But she tries to capture them by, again, kind of letting the viewer in on that person and feeling kind of what their environment feels like, this atmosphere. What's the, what's the atmosphere that's going on here? Now, this may sound really roundabout, but the way I actually found these mood lines was not from a photographer, not from a painter, but from a landscape architect. His name is John Ornsby Simmons. He was a visionary landscape architect. And what he did was he found out that certain designs made people feel a certain way. And when he used those designs, he developed what he called mood lines that we can use in photography. He says, one designs not places or spaces or things, one designs experiences. That was his goal. How can I have people come here and feel a certain way? And if you're designing a place, a playground, that has a certain feeling to it that's very different than designing a cemetery, right? They should feel different. And he actually uses these examples. Again, there's, all, there's a full range of emotions available to us. We don't have to stick in one or another. You know, a good movie takes you all over the place. You know, you feel like you've really moved emotionally. You're not just in a kind of a flat level thing. And a good photograph should move you as well. So one of the things he did was he moved the focus from just what plants needed to be put there in the design and that sort of thing to how people interacted and what was their response. So in that sense, he was using composition in a physical sense, which we can now take advantage of and learn from and use with our cameras. So he documented these in, a, in his book, and he actually drew lines in the book. And I got permission from the publisher, McGraw-Hill Education, to use them. And I'm going to show you some of these examples. This is a mood of active. That, the, the, the drawing there is his drawing. The photograph is my photograph. So he said, if you want to get the feeling of somebody being active, use a mood line that looks like that. Well, look at this. This is a kid. I was in mountaineering school. I actually was a mountaineering instructor. At this time, I was a student. And we, one of the things we had to do was cross raging rivers and do crazy stuff like this. And he's going across this pretty intense raging river on a rope, but it has that feeling of activity, doesn't it? It's definitely not a passive feeling. Of course, the water rushing gives you that feeling too, but there's a feeling of tension and activity that comes from the mood line itself. On the other hand, this is Lake Tahoe. Flat is passive. 
Now, if you're sending pictures, you're taking pictures, and you want to tell a story about how active you were on vacation, and you were getting out there and doing stuff, and you take a picture of everybody lying on the beach, that's going to not really go with the message. It's going to be a mixed message. So when you know these mood lines, you can also start to think of them, again, as a set of tools that you can use. And you can bring into your work or not, depending on the feeling that you're trying to convey. This is another one. This particular one that goes up like that gives the feeling of structural, solid, and strong. This is the ferry building in San Francisco. Taken with an iPhone, by the way. A lot of, a lot of the photos in the, in the book here are I have used an iPhone with. Um, but you get that feeling of strength, and you know it's really solid. It's not going to go away. It's not moving away. By the way, a lot of these. Actually, all these mood lines have their counterpart. So you'll see, like I showed you, active and passive. This is structural and strong, and this is fluid and soft. These are grasses on the coastline in Big Sur. That little wavy line gives the feeling of things being fluid. You can look at your own photographs after you see these things and see you probably have taken a lot of these without consciously knowing what they were, but you just kind of had the idea that might work. And I found it an interesting experience as I was going through and compiling the book to pull out of my own library examples of these and going, yeah, I didn't necessarily know at the time that that's what I was trying to convey, but it was. There was some kind of intuition here. Here's an interesting one. That jaggedy line, tenuous, uncertain, wavering, and in this self-portrait of Vincent van Gogh, everything we know about Vincent van Gogh was that he was completely uncertain of himself, wavering, he had no feeling he knew where he was going. As far as I remember, the only paintings he ever sold were to his brother, who bought them to support him, basically. And he was completely messed up. I mean, he ended up cutting his ear off, after all. So here's a guy who was definitely uncertain, wavering. And this, this painting is nothing but those jaggedy lines, wavering lines. And you may wonder, well, Mark, when am I ever going to use something like that? I don't know. But it should be in your toolkit. You may find that you have a reason, or you see something and you want to convey that emotion. It's there for your use. Um, this one's cool. This is another one in the Grand Tetons. You get this feeling of jagged, brutal, hard, vigorous, masculine. Let's say you wanted to take a, a portrait of a, you wanted your subject to look really masculine. You could take them against this backdrop and bring that feeling. So these are elements that you can use as other elements in composition and combine them. So if you're taking a portrait, use that kind of background to bring that feeling as contrasted to this one. I love this painting, Girl in a Hat. And this is from 1645-ish. And that curvy line gives you the feeling of tender, soft, curvilinear means curvaceous, you know, curvy, Marilyn Monroe, pleasant, feminine, beautiful. So again, let's say you're taking a portrait and you really want to enhance that in a woman, you might have her wear a big hat. Uh, or whatever your subject is, you can do that even with objects like this tree. Follows the same thing you get the feeling of that curviness. There's beauty there. There's, there's kind of that you know, warm sense going on. Of course, it, it helps with the sun behind it and that sort of thing. In my course, The Secrets to Amazing Photo Composition from the Masters, you're going to learn that every picture tells a story. But how do you tell yours? You're going to learn composition secrets that the master artists have used for centuries. You're going to learn how to pull your viewer into the center of interest of your photo. And how to use contrast to build excitement. What are the many different ways to frame your image? And how mood lines can affect your photo? Hey, what happens when you use the wrong mood to tell your story? And what really happens when you use the right one? 
I give you 83 composition techniques and how you can use them like a great chef uses recipes to create amazing meals. Jump on board with this course right now. You're going to love it.